Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Anne-Marie Morell, CEO and Editor-in-Chief of Politichicks.com and co-author of the book, What Women Really Want. I'm filling in for the irreplaceable Dr. Jamie Glazov on this first episode of 2015. And I also hosted the first episode of 2014. So Jamie, thank you for letting me fill in for you. I, I really appreciate it. And tonight, I am going to try not to gush. I do this every time. And now I've already said it, so there you go. Daniel Greenfield is one of the most prolific writers, possibly in all of America, maybe even the world. He, he's written over 7,000 articles for Front Page Magazine. He has a daily blog called Sultan Kanish. He is a Shulman Fellow and just a brilliant, brilliant mind. Daniel, happy, happy new year. Yeah, it's good to be just on the boundary between 2014 and 2015. Yeah, you're right. We're right there. By the time this airs, yeah. we're going to be. We're in the future, actually. Right yeah, now. we are. This is crazy. Yeah, we're, 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 we've got a little time machine here. <laughs> we do. And, and our, speaking of time, the, what I'm going to talk to you about is pretty much an overview of all of 2014, and also some predictions from you. I want to hear what you think of is going to be happening in 2015. And I want to start with where we started in January 2014, and that was with the Benghazi Senate hearings. Everyone was so hopeful. We thought something was going to come, uh, come out of this or someone would be held accountable. Nothing has happened. Trey Gowdy said a lot of stuff, but nothing happened. Is anyone ever going to be held accountable for Benghazi? Let's start with that. I don't think that the Congress itself is going to be able to hold anybody accountable for Benghazi. Uh, now there's actually more of a possibility now that Republicans have the Senate, but the Republican leadership is not focused on Benghazi. It's focused on what it thinks of as the bigger picture, which is miles away from Benghazi. Uh, the people who care about Benghazi are the family members of the loved, lost loved ones there. And there are conservatives who really care about the bigger issues, which is not the specific policy, but the content of our character, the values of our nation. And that's what really Benghazi comes down to. It comes down to uh, the bigger issue of how many American soldiers have died in Afghanistan and elsewhere uh, because they were neglected, because they were not cared for. It goes beyond Benghazi, and it goes to the larger issue of how do we treat our soldiers and how do we fight our wars. Mm. It's sad, but I, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I still hope someday something comes of this. I mean, are our embassies protected at all anywhere in the world? I mean, could, could another Benghazi happen tomorrow? Under Obama, we have two kinds of ambassadors, uh, professional ambassadors and people who donated money to his campaign. Uh, Obama has appointed a whole string of ridiculous figures who just happened to be campaign donors, not the small out-of-the-way places. He, didn't know, he wasn't appointing them ambassadors to the Bahamas. He was appointing them ambassador to the UK, to France, to all the major countries uh, in exchange for giving him money. Now, those people obviously have the best things possible. They spend a huge amount of money. Uh, the ambassador in uh, Belgium, who was accused of pedophilia, who was a Hillary and Obama donor, had, was having his mansion renovated at a huge expense at the same time that uh, Benghazi, they couldn't even put up a secure uh, mission facility there. They weren't even paying the terrorists that they were paying to protect the place. Mm -hmm. So there are two sets of priorities, and Chris Stevens, the guys in the Benghazi, they were considered second rate because they were not the Obama donors, they were not the big ticket guys, they were not the bundlers. Wow. Well, that brings us to Hillary, speaking of. Um, you've written extensively about Hillary Clinton in the past year, and you're convinced, I'm not sure I'm convinced, but you're convinced that she will be the 2016 candidate for president. What do you see happening with with Hillary in the next year? The Hillary phenomenon is really strange because on one hand, you have a woman who has absolutely no charisma, no real qualifications besides her last name, who is considered the heir apparent to the presidency, who was considered for years, years and years ahead of the race to be the only possible Democratic candidate in the race. Now, the left is pushing against her to some degree, and Hillary Clinton has been playing the control freak, her actual public appearances are terrible. So on the one hand, the Democrats have locked themselves into a candidate. On the other hand, Hillary has actually been absolutely terrible. Uh, her book tour collapsed. Uh, 
I believe the publisher was something like $10 million because of her advance. Uh, her tour included the ridiculous gaffes announcing that uh, she and her husband had been flat broke, which was a ridiculous lie. Yeah. So you have a candidate who's completely unappealing, but at the same time was the Democratic front runner. Mm. And the only alternative to Hillary is Elizabeth Warren, who we don't want either. Oh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Hillary Clinton makes Elizabeth Warren look charismatic. <laughs> or is it the other way around? They well, can never. Remember. I don't know. I, I think They're both, both of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the pantsuits. Come on. I, I don't know. I just can't imagine Democrat, young Democrats voting for Hillary. But we'll, we'll see in that. I want to talk about something especially serious that happened in 2014, and that was the VA scandal, basically death panels with people waiting to be treated and dying. You covered that extensively. Give us an overview of what happened with the VA and what has anything been fixed there? Uh, one of the thing, policies that Obama came into office with was cutting military health care. Uh, that meant uh, cutting, for example, TRICARE, which is military health care, uh, raising the costs of prescription drugs, raising costs uh, for military personnel and veterans. Uh, but uh, th things really exploded when we got to the VA because the VA is actually a literal life or death. Um, and you had people who had served our country who were being exploited and used. Uh, and meanwhile, there was a lot of money going into electronic record system keeping systems which were not being used. Uh, VA executives were getting bonuses, consultants were getting paid. And meanwhile, veterans were dying because they were not be getting very basic tests. Now, this is important because of the way we treat our veterans, but it's also important because this is a lot of what socialized medicine is. This is at the core socialized medicine. It's Obamacare. Uh, because the whole idea there is that you have to cut costs, and you cut costs not by cutting the salaries of executives. You cut costs by denying tests, by finding ways to remove medicines from lists until you get to actual death panels. So it's not just about veterans. It's about all of us. I, I, was, I was shocked that this wasn't a my, more of a bipartisan why, why more people weren't upset about this, because you wrote about how executives were spending millions of dollars on office furniture while veterans were dying. This isn't a Democrat-Republican thing at all, and yet, and yet people still ridiculed the right for, for calling it a scandal, which it was. Unfortunately, it was a democratic thing because the original policy came out of the Center for American Progress, which was a think tank that was basically Obama's evil brain. Uh, it pushed for the idea that there was a major crisis with military health care spending, and the policies that came out of that were the natural result, because once you say that we're spending too much money on military health care, it's a crisis, then you know there have to be ways to cut military health care, and you know that's going to cost better in lives. Mm. All right, let's, let's skip over to June. In June, Bo Bergdahl was released, who other, his own platoon people, his own, his own military people were saying that he was a deserter. Uh, it was very strange. He was, he was exchanged for Gitmo terrorists. What happened to Bo Bergdahl? And also, let's talk a little bit about Gitmo. And, and do you think that Obama is actually going to close Gitmo in 2015? Obama is releasing as many terrorists as he can. Uh, recently, he released a professional bomb maker, a trained suicide bomber, and a major forger. Uh, the most recent release, which I've written about, uh, which should run t this, this week, uh, tell, which is actually an exclusive, which says that one of the terrorists that Obama just released was captured with nuclear material on him that his notes said was being used to develop an atomic bomb. Now, if Obama let this guy out, then he will let absolutely everybody out. And if he lets absolutely everybody out, then there's no Gitmo. Okay, when we say letting them out, where do these people go? Well, it's the last one, the nuclear guy, actually was sent right back to Afghanistan. But just to live there, not in prison, right? Yeah, no. Yeah. I mean, none of these guys are going to prison. The guys who were sent to Ecuador, they have no, there's no, nothing keeping them in Ecuador. Ecuador is not being forced to keep them there. They can get on a plane and go anywhere. And what's going to keep them from coming right back here to America? Uh, well, you know, our top-notch border security, which yeah. under Obama is really uh, escape-proof and leak-proof. Absolutely. Nobody can get past it. I, I'm sure. Yeah, that's that's The that's security is almost as good as the White House. Oh, my gosh. Um, ISIS. 
ISIS was really, really big in 2014. It's kind of the first time that people started paying attention to Islamic terrorism, other than ridiculing the people who talk about Islamic terrorism. What, what's different about ISIS than Taliban, than Hamas, than Hezbollah, than Al Qaeda, than anything else? Why is ISIS, why did it capture so much attention this year, other than beheadings? ISIS isn't different. It's an expression of the same things that Hamas and Hezbollah and Al Qaeda and the Taliban were doing. Uh, but there are a few things. First of all, ISIS is much more successful. It beat national armies, it beat the Iraqi army. It did pretty well against other forces, so it actually managed to carve out its state, its own state across two countries. Nobody else had really managed to do that yet. And second of all, ISIS is really good at social media. Yeah. It's really good at bypassing the media filters, which would normally screen out all the stuff. So when they have a beheading, everybody finds out about it. When they announce that they're that they're raping little girls because Muhammad said that this was the way to do it, everybody finds out about it. So the media's ability to say, you know, this is just workplace violence happening in Iraq, uh, it's not working anymore with ISIS. Daniel, what do you think it's going to take to wake people up? If if they're not if they don't wake up watching an American being beheaded on YouTube, or or, or planes flying into our buildings for for that matter, what is it going to take? to make people understand that a good Muslim actually does follow the Quran, Surah 9, that Jamie always talks about. Those are the good Muslims, according to Muhammad. What is it going to take to make people understand that this is a serious issue? They want us dead. Well, unfortunately, too many people think that because something is a religion, that means it has to be a good thing, because we've learned to assume that all religions are the same. Islam is not like the religions that we understand. It's not like the religions that we're familiar with. Uh, it's a lot more like a murderous cult. I've called it a gang religion because it has a lot of the same values that you see in gangs, and there are gangs that actually have their own religions. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to get past the idea that all religions are created equal, that Islam is just as good as any other religion, because it's not. I mean, what, what makes a religion good is not just because you put the word religion in front of it, but because of its values, its morals, its content, what it makes people do and what it teaches people not to do. And this is where Islam parts company from all normative religion. Um, back, back in March, now we're going to skip from the Middle East over to Russia. There, were, there was a lot of posturing between Obama and Putin and all the stuff with, the Ukraine, with Ukraine and, and everything else. What do you see happening in 2015 with Putin and Obama? Well, nothing much. The one thing that Obama can do reliably is appease and uh, run useful, run completely useless hashtags and sanctions that don't really accomplish anything. Uh, Putin is basically up against his own dysfunctional economy. Uh, he's up against uh, his neighbors who all have a long, centuries-long reason to distrust Russia. Uh, the United States has no influence in the region now because Obama has basically destroyed American influence. All you can do is uh, run a hashtag and uh, run some more useful sanctions that you'll take apart in the next five minutes. And what about Israel? What, what's, what, what do you see in 2015 with Israel? With well, Obama has lost all influence over America's enemies or over neutral parties. What he can do is beat up allies, and Israel is one of the closer allies. And Israel also makes for a very good scapegoat because Obama's policies have thoroughly wrecked the Middle East. Uh, the Middle East is a mess. Uh, the rise of ISIS is largely attributable to Obama's Arab Spring. So Israel makes for a very good scapegoat. It's been that way for a while because you can just say, you know, if we just solve the Israeli-Palestinian thing, the region will be stabilized. And somehow the Sunnis will stop killing the Shiites in mm -hmm. Syria and Iraq if only Israel creates a PLO terrorist state inside its own borders. But don't you think John Kerry can be a peacemaker there? Just kidding. Oh. <laughs> You know, John Kerry has a lot of experience with that sort of thing. He met mm. with the Viet Cong. He met with the yeah. Sandinistas. You know, if, at some point, he'll meet with the Taliban and maybe with ISIS, and then we'll get to see him in a very special video. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> all right. We, we've got about two minutes left, but, of course, we have to cover Ferguson and all of the riots. And what's saddest to me is out of all our veterans, out of all our military personnel who, who lost their lives in 2014, out of all the people in the world that have lost their lives in 2014, most people will only remember two names, Mike Brown and Eric Garner. 
what do you think is going to, what do you see is going to be happening? You, we were talking earlier about um, New Year's out in, New, in um, with all the protests happening in New York right now. And who is running those protests? Well, with the Democrats in power, we're reverting back to the 70s mm -hmm. and the same anti-cop rhetoric. On the other hand, you have the usual communist groups. You have the Trotskyists, you have Revcom, and you have all the Marxists out in action. And they're always looking for some issue to attach themselves to, to pretend that they're a grassroots organization, uh, that they're just concerned citizens. And they're not. They're professional troublemakers. And this is what they consider part of their war on capitalism. They will show up to absolutely anything. They were showing up through to the Earth March with signs saying that the only way to save the environment is destroy capitalism. Mm. So it's basically just all, all, the same hippies over and over and over recycling their stuff. That, that brings us to the last part. You just, you just released your article for Front Page about the person of the year. And just tell us about that and why you chose who you did. Uh, in 2014, there have been good things and there have been bad things. One of the worst things about 2014 has been a very sharp, dramatic increase in police shootings. Mm -hmm. uh, we've tripled the number of ambush attacks on police officers, and those are attacks that are deliberate, calculated assassinations, uh, like the two NYPD officers who were killed here in New York City. Uh, at the same time, we don't really pay enough attention to police officers. We don't look at how many of them are being killed on the line of duty. We don't look at the risks that they take and the suffering that their families go through every day, just wondering if their fathers will come home that day. And it's important, especially now that, we've got, that we're popularizing the 70s anti-police rhetoric uh, pushed by the Black Lives Matters crowd, that we remember just how the sacrifices that the police officers make. They're fighting in a war for civilization, and they're not being recognized for it. Not only that, they're being demonized and demeaned for it. Mm. So your person of the year is the American police officer. And I, I think that that article has just taken off like crazy. I'm really happy about that. It's a really beautiful piece. And I urge everyone to read it at Front Page Magazine. You can type in, in the search bar, type Daniel Greenfield, and you'll see his eight gazillion articles for Front Page. And the point is his, is his daily blog on Front Page. Daniel, thank you so much for everything. Um, I, I always learn from you. I read your, your stuff every single day. It's the first thing I do before I do anything else. And I um, want to wish you a very happy new year. Well, hopefully we all have a happy new year. And you know, it's always wonderful to do an interview with somebody who actually reads my work and who, <laughs> I, who asks insightful questions. You know, I've done interviews with uh, radio station in Montana didn't seem to know who I was and wasn't entirely clear on what this whole Iraq war thing was. And this um, is a definite step up. <laughs> well, good. Well, thank you so much. And everybody, please, please, please read Sultan Kanish. That's his daily blog. And of course, all of his stuff on Front Page Magazine every single day. And stay tuned. When we come back, we will have Michael Cutler talking about immigration.